March of Vineyard after two months. I had to come back for Orlando Patterson. And to have William Joyce Wilson and Orlando Patterson, two of the uh, greatest sociologists of the 20th and the 21st century, here with us, and have Cornell West uh, in the audience to observe, is something of a miracle. And that is one of the miracles of being here at Harvard. So please. <laughs> starts off the colloquia each week is the um, director of the Du Bois Institute Fellows Program, Krishna Lewis. Welcome, everybody, to the first colloquium of the academic year. Um, Professor Gates has said it all. Let me just uh, add one or two more details. Next week, our colloquium will be delivered by Todd Nay Thomas. She's professor of African American religious, religions here at Harvard. And she'll be speaking on abstracting, resurrecting, and profaning sacred matter, black church, ars black church arson in the museum. And now please welcome to the podium um, Professor William Julius Wilson, um, a university professor here, a professor of sociology. And please do come next week to a three-day celebration of his work, um, a recognition of his career and contribution to the field. That'll be next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday here at Harvard. And the information is available on our website. Thank you very much. I want to welcome all the new fellows. You know, I'm chair of the fellowship committee, so I know your applications. We hope to be able to meet all of you. Even though I'm retiring, I'm going to continue as chair of the, of the Du Bois Fellowship Committee. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> all right. So, you know, I'm really honored uh, to introduce my esteemed colleague, Orlando Patterson, at this first Du Bois Fellowship Colloquium of the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, Orlando is the John Coles Professor of Sociology. He's an outstanding historical, comparative, and cultural sociologist, and his work has been widely read and cited. As University of California Berkeley sociologist Luik Waquant stated in a December 2014 Harvard Magazine article, it was a cover page article, devoted to the work of Orlando Patterson. He, Waquant states, quote, in an era when social scientists specialize in ever smaller objects, he is a Renaissance scholar who takes the time to tackle huge questions across multiple continents and multiple centuries. There was another scholar like this in the early 20th century named Max Weber. Orlando is in that category, unquote. By the way, Loic is one of my students. He'll be here next week, too. <laughs> and I'm going to tell him that. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that quote. <laughs> now, Patterson uh, is the author of eight academic books, including The Sociology of Slavery, 1967, An Analysis of the Origins, Development, and Structure of Negro Slavery in J Jamaica, 1968, Ethnic Chauvinism, The Reactionary Impulse, 1977. Huh? Yeah, which I reviewed. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, Slavery and Social Death, 1982. Freedom and the Making of Western Culture, 1991. Rituals, Rituals of Blood, Consequences of Slavery, and Two American Centuries, 1999. Freedom, 
colon, Freedom in the Modern World, 2006, and The Cultural Matrix, Understanding Black Youth with Ethan Fossey. And I would like to, because of time constraints, I would like to only sort of highlight three of these great books as representing major contributions to the literature on inequality. Slavery and Social Death, published in 1982, has been frequently cited and has been considered by a number of scholars as among the landmark studies of, of slavery. The book reflects prodigious scholarship and excellent craftsmanship by creatively amassing and integrating materials in history, the social sciences, and the humanities. Indeed, slavery and social death has been described as a model for interdisciplinary scholarship. Patterson's Freedom in the Making of Western Culture is a groundbreaking study also. Ranging over Roman history, Greek tragedy and philosophy, and the emergence of medieval, secular, and religious thought and explains how freedom, political, civic, and personal, evolved in a powerful value in the Western world. Freedom in the Making of Western Culture, the third book I'm highlighting here, won the 1991 National Book Award for Nonfiction. It also won the Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship Award of the American Sociological Association and was co-winner of the best book on pluralism from the American Political Science Association. And finally, The Cultural Matrix, Understanding Black Youth, addresses a challenging question. How do we account for the extraordinary integration and prominence of black youth in popular culture, as well as their espousal of several deeply held American values, despite their segregation and isolation in inner city ghettos, symbolized by high school dropout rates, chronic joblessness, and endemic violence. To unravel this paradox, Patterson advances an original theoretical explanation that includes an insightful interrogation of the role of culture that avoids the theoretical limitations of earlier culture of poverty approaches. Patterson clearly demonstrates that black youth culture has to be understood as a complex matrix that combines the American mainstream culture of power, wealth, and consumption with ghetto street culture, African-American vernacular, and hip-hop music. In so doing, Patterson demonstrates the power of interdisciplinary work as he draws upon and integrates works from the social sciences, history, soci social philosophy, and ethnomusicology, and brilliantly demonstrates how culture interacts with structural and environmental forces. Now, in addition to his scholarly writings, Orlando Patterson is the author of three novels, and he has published frequently in widely read outlets, most notably the New York Times, where he was a guest columnist for several weeks. His columns have also appeared in the Washington Post, Time Magazine, Newsweek, The New Republic, and The Public Interest. Aside from the awards associated with his book, Freedom and the Making of Western Culture, which I've already mentioned, Orlando was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1991. He is a recipient of the Annisfeld Wolf Book Award for Lifetime Achievement and was awarded the Order of Distinction by the government of Jamaica in 1999. He is also the recipient of several honorary degrees 
including honorary doctorates from the University of Chicago, UCLA, and La Trobe University in Australia. Now, I think it would be appropriate to describe Orlando as both an outstanding scholar and leading public intellectual. His work has resonated not only across academic disciplines, including sociology, history, anthropology, philosophy, and political science, but has influenced thinking among the educated public and policymakers as well. Please join me in welcoming Orlando Patterson as he speaks on race and diversity at Harvard over the past 50 years. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Brother Bill. I really appreciate that. I have the opportunity next week to um, <laughs> return the, the compliment um, as I'm looking forward to that celebration, uh, well-deserved celebration of your life's work next week. And um, I hope all of you here attend. Um, so, Race and diversity at Harvard the last 50 years. Um, <laughs> let me say that, um, show my age to say that this is partly uh, something I've observed over the past 50 years. Um, it's based on partly personal experience then and observation, but also the data, uh, very rich data available on the subject. I gave this talk originally, Leverett, in um, celebration of the life of Dean Archie Epps at Leverett's house um, as the first um, Archie Epps inaugural lecturer. And um, he's someone, of course, who is one of the earliest, uh, the first dean of Harvard, black dean of Harvard College in 1964, and a friend and um, someone I greatly admired. Um, and um, a talented uh, music college musician who um, did much for the promotion of music here at Harvard, but more importantly, uh, played a pivotal role is, as dean of um, uh, at Harvard and as um, senior t assistant senior tutor. I got to know him way back um, when I was senior tutor at Leverett House, and um, Epps's influence was tremendous. He was greatly loved by students and contributed considerably to um, the promotion of diversity at Harvard. He is one of the earliest um, uh, uh, man of color in that position. The second person I want to, um, us to remember is the Reverend Peter Gomes, uh, died in 2011, much too young. Um, uh, from my perspective, these are all young men, died in their prime. Um, uh, professor Peter Gomes um, was prom a professor of Christian morals at Harvard Divinity School, the first uh, to occupy this um, esteemed position as Pusey Minister at Harvard's Memorial Church. One of the great preachers of our generation and a living symbol of courage and conviction is how President Drew Foss described him, and that was an excellent and, and very um, accurate description as anyone who's heard him preach. But more importantly, not only is he one of the pioneers in terms of diversity, um, his presence was large and powerful at Harvard. And um, he, uh, his direct uh, role, apart from his presence here, his preaching, um, is that he was chair of the committee that established the Harvard Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations. And um, while it remained in the background after that, um, it was a, a background that uh, powerfully sort of cast a powerful um, uh, sort of influence on what went on both in the um, foundation and elsewhere, greatly beloved by students, faculty, and others. And he inspired many with his preaching. Um, he brought to Harvard 
course, not just his formidable personality and self, but also the great tradition of black preaching. Uh, uh, white folks had never heard this before. Uh, and, um, and, you know, she, um, in integrating the best uh, of the tradition of preaching, uh, of black preaching with, with um, Western tradition of preaching was, um, was masterful. Um, he is named a member of the most venerable order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem. Um, if you don't know what that is, well, you, know, you should go and look it up, the oldest order of chivalry in Britain. Uh, he is greatly admired in Britain too, as much as he was here. But to get back to our um, point, he was just an extraordinary figure in um, the development of um, diversity um, at Harvard. Finally, I want us to um, remember Professor Alan Counter. I get that. I had three L's there. I'm sure you wouldn't mind. But again, someone who died much too young, much too young. Um, uh, anyone who died before me was my age died much too young. Yeah. <laughs> and a um, neuroscientist, an explorer, and university administrator. He was the founding uh, member of the. Um, Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations, the organization that um, Peter, in effect, um, persuaded Harvard to set up. And he just did a great job at that. So he's directly involved with the issue of diversity. And um, he, was, he brought sort of um, people from all walks of life and from all traditions, uh, both in the popular uh, media as well as academia. Uh, to this university, so students just loved him. It is just a remarkable sight seeing him interacting with students. And um, he was also an himself an explorer and championed the unsung black explorer, Matthew Henson, um, who was one of the discoverers of the Arctic and for one for a long time neglected. Um, he was knighted by the King of Sweden. And, um, but more, more importantly, um, he just did a great job bringing together um, students of all backgrounds uh, at Harvard. He worked hard at it and, um, and succeeded. So these are the three people who, uh, we're not just celebrating, but in fact, we're, I'm saying they are critical in the story I'm about to tell uh, in the development of diversity at Harvard. Okay. So diversity, what is it? We all have different views of it. We all think we know what it is. But as soon as we try to get into it, it becomes complicated. So um, maybe let's start with what, how the courts define it. Because Harvard um, attempts at diversity is in many ways determined by um, what the court um, permit. So Justice Lewis Powell defended the limited consideration of race in admissions on the grounds that fostering diversity represents, quote, a compelling state interest. And he described genuine diversity as something that encompasses a far broader array of qualifications and characteristics of which racial or ethnic origin, but a single, though important element. That was a, a, a very important statement. It sort of brought to a halt, at least temporarily, the vicious, um, and well-funded attack on diversity uh, in, um, in the nation. And was, of course, the legal groundwork for, um, for Harvard and other universities uh, committed to diversity. Now, Harvard's view, official view, if you like, since this is, um, comes from the, um, the Gazette, is sort of, is broadly speaking, diversity is the word we use to describe a mixture of individuals and ideas, the traditions, belief cultures, systems that come with them. Students who say that diversity in school is important to them are looking for institutions to offer a variety of curricular and non-curricular opportunities to learn from and learn with people of different ethnicities, races, ages, abilities, sexual identities, classes, and religions. You know, it's much broader than simply ethnic diversity. And the guiding principle is that of the whole person, which Harvard takes seriously and has made um, a really important attempts to um, develop. 
Um, and um, Drew Faust, whom we must sort of um, pay special respects to as someone who really uh, was profoundly committed to development of, of um, diversity and um, put her put the money and uh, her efforts where her mouth is on this, um, reflected on this in the following ways in, this, in, in developing on and building on the Supreme Court position. Uh, and, and it's worth citing because this is the guiding, it's still the guiding principle, if you like, in Harvard's efforts. In today's diverse society, um, she told the Gazette, it's more important than ever to be able to live, work, and interact with people with different backgrounds, life experience, and so on. At Harvard, we strive to foster a diverse campus community that prepares students as citizens in an increasingly connected world and global economy. And she was very happy with the decision. And Harvard's emphasis on the whole person, that the educational mission of Harvard is not just to produce um, uh, uh, people of um, particular academic um, excellence. It certainly remains the, um, the dominant um, uh, aim, but also, um, and especially with our undergraduates, the development of whole persons, of uh, individuals um, whose um, view of the world um, is not circumscribed by um, just um, what their academic scores are, um, but their ability to interact with um, others, to learn from others, and also to give to others um, what they themselves, either from their own privilege or from their own special background, have acquired out of school. In a way, the whole person idea acknowledges something which uh, we academics are too often inclined to forget, that most of what we know, most of what we have to give to the world, we learn not in school, but outside of school, uh, from our parents, um, from the communities, from our networks, uh, and from um, uh, in our peer group. It's the social and cultural capital um, which we acquire. And, um, and every community, uh, no matter how poor, um, uh, uh, has something to offer uh, in, in this regard. And um, that is critical to remember. So how do I view diversity as a sociologist? Right? In a way, I look at it on a continuum. Um, there's one that we call differential diversity at one extreme. That is to say, there's a collection of people who um, make the society diverse by virtue of the fact that they're there, but they have little to do with each other. The extreme is, in a, in a sense, a society of a separatist. Um, different, um, each person in his own small corner and her own small corner doing their ethnic thing. And um, as I said, the extreme of this is, a, is, is, is separatism. Um, and um, in a way, there was for a long time, America was very much like that. Um, you know, the South is a very diverse society <laughs> in a separatist way. And, um, it, it, it's, um, and sadly, there are societies around the world where you see this happening. Um, India is a very diverse society. But um, the more one reads about the sort of communal violence and the sort of tensions, especially in Kashmir and other places like that, um, one sees examples of this. Um, Myanmar, Burma is a diverse society, large number of people all separate and, um, a, and increasingly breaking into hostility. Indeed, the frequency of violence in such societies indicates the great danger and the main problem with this kind of separatist diversity. Um, the, um, there are some people who still advocate that for America. Um, of course, the, the white supremacists today. Um, but there are certain misguided um, uh, uh, fellow um, people of color who um, at one time, in, in a way understandably, in the reaction against centuries of racist separation, um, advocated a kind of black um, separatism. Um, but there's one remarkable advocate of this right now, 
uh, who may sh you may be shocked to hear, um, Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, there's a book which is coming out, which I reviewed for the New York Times. It'll be coming out in um, October. Uh, I couldn't believe uh, the book when I got it. Uh, the, 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 just reading the initial description, book by Robin, and um, about Clarence Thomas's philosophy. And uh, Robin, amazing thesis, sort of trying to understand Clarence Thomas. How come, how is it that the most conservative legal um, justice in America is a black man? Um, that's a puzzle. <laughs> This is a real puzzle. I mean, this guy is generally is an extremist conservative. You know, he's, he's the, the, as the president, our dear president, says he's my favorite justice. And, and for once, he's talking the truth. Um, and and um, so how is this possible? And Robin comes up with, and there have been several attempts at trying to explain Clarence Thomas. Robin's remarkable thesis in the enigma of is that Thomas is really a black nationalist. That, um, <laughs> I, 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 when I read this sort of, you know, um, out, outline of the book, I said, I, I was about to throw away. This is, I, I, just, I was about to tell the Times, you know, find somebody else to review this. <laughs> is this Robin Kelly? No, it's, the surname is Robin. His name is Robin. I forget the first name, oh, no, Robin. Okay. Um, but then I read the work, which is a very detailed, the enigma of Clarence Thomas, very detailed. You know, he said he did not patronize him. He said, we're going to look at everything. This is the man on the left, but he said, you know, this is not um, a, a critique. This is, I'm going to take this guy seriously. What drives this guy? How is this possible? And his argument was that Thomas started off as a black nationalist. He, he, he definitely, I mean, you know, was when he was at, um, was at Holy Cross, um, uh, his, um, you know, he studied the speeches of Malcolm X by heart, and he was very, very committed to, you, know, you may not want that, that part of it. Now, now the, the assumption is that he gave this up. But Robin's remarkable thesis is that, no, he didn't give it up. He just, what he did was to, if you like, reinterpret that position in very conservative terms. And at what drives a lot of his thinking is, is, is this. So for example, his objection to affirmative action is not that it hurts whites. In fact, he sometimes takes digs at his white conservative colleagues by saying, you know, you're playing the role of victim, <laughs> come on. But at the times, blacks, and that blacks don't need whites to learn and so on. And he really believes in this um, separate economic development for blacks and so on. He's a separatist in many ways. Of course, the enigma and the contradiction is that he's happily married to a white woman. So, you know, I mean, but, I mean, <laughs> the man is full of contradictions and so on, right? You know, but that's the problem with separatists. They end up with a lot of contradictions. But, you know, it's a fascinating thesis. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I urge you to read the book. But uh, whatever. Um, separatism doesn't work and it often leads to violence. And it's cruel and it's vicious and it's inhumane. And um, it sort of um, undermines what is most fundamental about us as human beings, that it's our common humanity. Um, then I was called a pluralist diversity. Pluralism. Pluralism sort of moves away from separatism. It recognizes, at least you recognize others as equal as opposed to inferior, which, uh, you know. Uh, you recognize that maybe in the public sphere you have to interact with them and so on. But that's it. Each person does his thing. I mean, the Irish do their thing on St. Patrick's Day. You may go out, but you won't hold a green flag. You'll say, all right, you do your thing. Um, blacks do their thing, right? Native Americans, Hispanics do their things and so on. Uh, but that's it. And you accept the fact that you have a place in a society. But you're not going any further than that. You know, you, you do your thing. You, know, you, uh, you have your own standards of beauty. You have your own achievements. You celebrate your own people. I celebrate mine. I let you do your thing. I do my thing. 
there's pluralist diversity. I think a lot of people see that way in America. I don't think it takes us very far. Um, uh, it's better than separatism, but um, it's, um, for me, um, a, a, a very poor and not very um, significant way or important way of improving um, our lives as people living, different people living in a single society. But that's where a lot of American diversity is now. In some cases, people might, when it's convenient, advocate, you know, um, being a, um, more like one type of person than another. And one of the interesting things about um, uh, identity is um, that there's no single identity. And um, one can sometimes manipulate this. Um, but that brings me to the third kind of diversity, multicultural diversity. This one recognizes something I just said, that we do not each have a single identity, which is a common view, that you're born you know, as a black person or as a Jew or as an Indian American and so on. And over the course of your upbringing, that a core identity develops. And that's you, that defines you. I'm a black man, I'm a black woman, I'm a Jewish man, or what have you, right? I'm a Native American. And it's uh, two things about this. One, it assumes that there's a single dominant identity for everyone. And number two, it assumes that the most important thing defining this single determining identity is your ethnic background. Okay, your blackness, your Jewishness, your what have you. Um, many ways, that's where we're at. As I think many people advocate this view. Um, and um, it allows for and it tolerates other identities. It allows for interactions. Um, but of course, you can see what its um, limitations are. It also prevents, it is a sort of boundary which can't be crossed. Can it be because, you know, to cross these boundaries is to violate what is central to your identity? Okay, um, you gotta respect that. In fact, many people feel strongly about this. Um, the, uh, but you can see how it can be problematic uh, in certain circumstances. Um, the problem with that is that modern social psychology and study of personality generally indicates that the old traditional view that we have a single defining identity which you know, emerge in our upbringing, and that's it. By the time you're 15, that's it. Forget anything else. You, you know, you are what you are. I am what I am. And that thing is what emerged in my upbringing and my ethnic background. And it's sacred, and don't you dare even question it. Well, we know now in our modern complex society that ain't so. Uh, you have to be very profoundly committed to that idea for it to be so, okay? We have a plurality of identities, and we shift between them. Um, I'm a black American here, a black American, an academic, talking to you. Come 20, 20th of December, as soon as my last lecture is over, I get on a JetBlue plane, I go to Jamaica, and you won't understand the way I speak, even though I'm speaking, <laughs> I'm speaking English, especially if I'm talking to one of my close friends from school days. My whole manner, my whole identity as a Jamaican um, takes over, okay? And it's very different from my black identity. I also shift classes. I'm an upper middle class person as a Harvard professor here, right? 
but I come from a working class, rural Jamaican black background. I almost said black brown. Because <laughs> 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 this is a, I live here in a multi-racial society. This is a, I grew up in a society that's almost 100% black, okay? Uh, speaking Creole, so it's a different person from the person you're seeing here. But I don't erupt into conflict, making that shift, okay? Um, and you can think of many other examples. Also, it's not just that we have a plurality of identities, but there are what I call culture, instead of seeing a single culture, um, black, a white culture or what have you, What's becoming clear now, and I try to explore that at some length in the work which Bill very kindly mentioned, the cultural matrix, is that in our modern complex modern societies, we do not have single cultures. What we have is what I call a multiplicity of cultural configurations, okay? Clusters of beliefs and so on, uh, and we shift between them. When I'm in a seminar room with my colleagues, I'm with one cultural configuration. We talk alike, we, you know, we have similar ideas and so on. Um, race and color, class doesn't matter, we are academics. That's one cultural configuration. It's real and it's an important part of my identity. My colleagues in the Harvard Sociology Department and the broader Harvard community. Well, when I move to, you know, um, relationship, I can move to, just within Harvard itself to, um, other friends who are not academics, a base of our friendship may be based on attending the same church or, um, you know, interests, common interests in sports or what have you. It's a whole different um, cultural configuration. And in our modern complex society, especially the urban part of it, and we're increasingly urban, it's, what, it's how we live. Just, just examine yourself for a minute and think of how very different are the set of clusters of values, norms, beliefs, and so on, that shape your interaction at home with sort of old friends or so on, or from one work setting, or in a church setting, or synagogue setting, or what have you. Um, so, a multiplicity, we have many different identities. And it's just not true that we get split into many parts and create serious psychological problems for ourselves uh, when we move from one to the other. That ain't never been the case with me, and I don't know about you. Um, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, intercultural um, diversity, in a way, I see as the, ideally, the expression of this idea of a multiplicity of identities and groups and cultural configurations. It's where America is, and for many of us, we share that, okay? But um, finally, there's what may be called integral identity. And that's where you, are, in a sense, we get, we not only observe each other, we not only respect each other from a distance and so on, but we integrate. And that's true of some of us, in that we actively um, identify, not only identify with, but assimilate, to use a word that's becoming so unpopular, um, with each other. Uh, whether as lovers, uh, or as um, deep friendships, and so on. And that's I see for the future. Okay, so. Harvard reflects the nation through this continuum. Um, America's struggle with that diversity, the civil rights movement at its turning point, and the par paradoxical development since then. And I just want to add one um, general point about this broader development which Harvard reflects. So when Du Bois defined the 20th century, the century of the color line, he's perfectly right, but the color line was for him, in, when he wrote that, there are two color lines, or two aspects of it. There is the color line in a public sphere, the fact that blacks had no position in the public sphere. The whole point of segregation was, in fact, to prevent blacks from having any place in the public sphere. Um, the vi one of the great achievements, sh brief achievements, of one of America's few radical moments, Reconstruction, is that 
The Reconstruction leaders recognized that, that slavery was not just personal, but also cultural exclusion and political exclusion, exclusion from the public sphere. And you know, they tried and they almost succeeded in doing that. But the savage reaction against that was to remove blacks from the public sphere. Lynching was not just killing, it had an important cultural and political effect, was to remove blacks, deny blacks any position in the public sphere. Whether it's politics, whether it's culture, and so on. They succeeded. Ralph Ellison talked about being invisible. That's what he meant. And if you want to see invisibility, to ask your students or in student aid to do a simple experiment, which I often ask students to do. Go back to as late as, even as late as 1960, certainly like 1959, and just skim through all the great newspapers and magazines, even liberal ones uh, like the New Yorker and so on, and see what you don't see. I mean, there's no mention of blacks. They're invisible, publicly. But there's another, even equally important as the color line, the personal, interactional. Blacks were also excluded from that on the personal level. Now, that's what segregation is about. Um, now, the interesting thing about the Civil Rights Revolution was that it succeeded mightily in removing one of those two spheres of separation. It was successful, and you know, sometimes I'm reading, you know, we're in an era of pessimism right now, but let our pessimism not take us too far. The Civil Rights Revolution was a revolution. I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here, uh, Bill wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this. But more important, we wouldn't have had a black president. Well, it's not just a black president, but the fact that one of the two leading parties, a major, major component are black people. I mean, we are part of the public sphere, not only in political life, but also in the leadership of many of the nation's great corporations and so on. A black woman leads uh, the Xerox Corporation. I don't have to go through the list. It's just incredible, American Express and so on. That's unthinkable. That's being part of the public sphere. Still have a ways to go. But I think if you were to ask what is the success of the civil rights movement, it is being part of the public sphere, of which the universities are an important part. Okay? Um, but there's a spectacular failure of the civil rights movement. The other part of the boys, color line, black Americans still remain larger segregated in the private sphere. A whole lot, all, many other groups are coming and are entering the private sphere. So it reflected a crude measurement being rate of intermarriage. It's very high among, say, Asian American, especially, I mean, more Japanese American women have marry, at some, by some estimates, even at a higher rate of out, out marriage, non Japanese Americans than locally in, insiders. Uh, Hispanics are integrating at that private level. Okay? Um, your clubs, your interactions, your friendships, and so on. The um, as you know, at the elementary school level, it's as, integrate, it's as segregated to, um, now as it was in Martin Luther King's day, 1970. Okay, so that's where we're at. And in many ways, what Harvard is doing um, reflects all of this. So let's move, because colleges play a major role in this se second kind of, um, in, this, this the, the private sphere integration. That I see as, it's in the schools that it's happened, right? It's not gonna happen at home, at the given how segregated, you know, don't, don't, let's, let, let's, when you think of segregation, don't just think of working in lower class black people. As Mary Patilla has shown definitively, the black middle class is as segregated as the black working class. It may come as a surprise to you because we are the exceptions who live <laughs> in integrated communities, but just remember that. And that second task is going to be, the, it's the, well, it should begin with schools, which is why we paid so much emphasis on school integration. That's where we thought it was going to happen. Okay, Brown versus, you know, Board of Education. We thought it was going to happen there. It hasn't happened. 
New York has the most segregated, the most liberal state in the nation has the most segregated schools. So it's not happening there. It's at a college level that, in fact, it's happening. Okay? So let's look at Harvard. Um, so there's a pre-50s era of differential um, diversity, separatism. <laughs> the days when uh, poor Du Bois came here and you know, couldn't get a place to live, I mean, you know, in, and so on, right? There are a few, but just string, sprinkling. In fact, just Harvard are separatists, they're hardly students. Um, people are, couldn't live, find places to live. Um, Ewart Guineer, in his case, he had to leave because he couldn't afford it, and Harvard wasn't coming up with the funds to so help him, um, and so on. Then um, the, um, the pluralist phase, uh, wait, let's, let's go back here. Say um, about 55 so to 69, when you begin to get more uh, people. Um, uh, originally, Jews being accepted in <laughs> society. Just forget, don't forget that at one point there was a, 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 a quota on Jews coming to Harvard and so on. Um, but other groups coming in, but still a polite sort of pluralist diversity as I defined it. Uh, that's about the shift began, there are no black professors. That shift began about 69 when we begin to get serious move towards a more multicultural diversity. And then I have to flag certain people, um, like David Evans, the appointment of Martin Kilsen as the first black professor in FAS. I came here in January 1970. That was, uh, um, so next January is going to be 50 years, my goodness. Um, and um, I wonder, I left my lovely home on the hillside in, the, in St. Andrew, Kingston, and landed in a snowstorm in Harvard, <laughs> and was put up in um, this is brick um, apartments, cold brick apartments over um, botanic gardens. Well, I thought badly named. Um, I thought, oh, I'm going to go to Botanic Gardens. Uh, so they said, you can give up my nice home in Red Hills for this. And so I thought I should get on the first plane and get back home. <laughs> anyway, I stayed and therefore lived through um, this era, right? And, um, and then by the 1980s, something, there's a big shift to a genuine intercultural diversity. We saw that with, um, in the most significant development there was the African American um, Studies Program the Du Bois Institute, the coming of um, Professor Gates, um, and um, made a major, major shift in which we had a department which wasn't just a black studies department in which the majority of the faculty were in fact non-black. And um, that was a significant shift um, from what we had when we, when, when the African American Studies Department started, which was seen by students in separatist terms. This is a place for blacks who ate separately and we don't want any white people. They were quite explicit about that, okay? Um, and um, the agenda was a separatist one. But sort of uh, people like Kilson fought against this. Uh, myself, um, Gate, uh, you know, the, um, uh, Peter Gomes, we were appointed the same year we took a strong stand against that, a strong stand. And in fact, Peter Gomes is chairing the intercultural part of us, making it clear that we're going to shift from any kind of, not just separatism, but even a kind of weak, weak-willed pluralist thing to a more multicultural view. And um, that was developed wonderfully by um, Professor Gates and other members of that department. Well, we're yet to go forward. But we have succeeded greatly. And I want now to just go through some of the, uh, the data on where Harvard is at, because the news I have, as you must know, is that Harvard has succeeded to a considerable degree in achieving uh, intercultural um, diversity. Uh, it's amazing how much, uh, given what the situation was that I was here, myself and Kilson were the only two black professors in arts and sciences. 
uh, what a difference. So um, there's something called an overall diversity score. Um, and um, you know, one to 100, 100 being best. And here's a overall diversity score. Um, combined ethnic, geographic, gender, and age diversity. Harvard is doing very well on, uh, on any count. Um, it ranks 98 out of 100. Um, in ethnic diversity, uh, in gender diversity, in geographic diversity, this is, it ranks, by the way, number one, and an overall um, ethnicity. This, this is worth celebrating. We'll look at it in more detail. It's just stunning progress over the last 30 years in faculty diversity, in undergraduate diversity, in administrative diversity. Not going to say much about that, except to note right now something which was unthinkable when I came here. The big dean, the big dean, the arts and sciences faculty is um, Professor Claudine Gay. Uh, but also the dean of the social sciences uh, is Professor uh, Larry Bobo. I mean, this is, if you had mentioned this to me even 20 years ago, I would say, come on, stop being naive. That's, okay. Uh, and both are both professors of African American studies. Both, both, both are, both are, yes. You're, <laughs> you're, you're very important in bringing them here, right? Absolutely. Uh, so this is why I said, I mean, that, that you're coming and the African American studies department shifting its focus from being an Afro-Black Studies program to being an intercultural uh, program was critical in that, okay? Um, the faculty demographics are really quite remarkable. Um, uh, what's developed? So let's start with the faculty because it's in a way it's the heart uh, of, the, of the university. Uh, the faculty is more diverse than ever. So the women making up 30% of tenured and, and tenure track faculty and minorities making up 23%. Of the 84 tenured and tenure track professors who joined Harvard in 2018, 42% were women and 36% minorities. That's progress. Um, the, um, now, Harvard, <laughs> it's more difficult for Harvard to do this than other universities for one simple reason. <laughs> People don't leave Harvard very often. <laughs> so, so you don't get many opportunities <laughs> to do it, which makes their achievement all the more remarkable. It can only come through growth. Uh, and the few people who, 95% of the Harvard faculty um, in any given year remain there. This is not true of most other uh, institutions. Um, and um, so it's through growth. But one important change that Harvard made, which was critically related to this, all the different kinds of, um, of diversities, um, gender, ethnic, and so on, is something that didn't exist when I came here. Harvard did not have a tenure track program, which stymied all attempts at, um, at diversity. Because the way Harvard worked up to about, um, up to about 2000, for his first several hundred years, was no, we don't have tenure track. We leave that to other places, maybe MIT and so on. But what we do when we want uh, professors, we go and we search the world and get the best. That was the direction. Okay, not from your own faculty, which had no, <laughs> you know, advantage in being appointed. Which meant, in fact, you had a huge turnover because most people coming to Harvard just assumed they weren't going to get promoted. It's a stepping stone to go somewhere else. And you go somewhere else and you make your, fa your fame, you gain fame and so on, and then they may look at you and say, okay, how do you compare with the best in the world? That program prevented any serious attempt at diversity. Or in fact, when bringing people in, um, uh, uh, you know, it, you can see, you don't need much imagination to see how that's good. They changed that, and that was a very, very significant change. Because, you know, it meant, you can start promoting people. For one, many minority people wouldn't want to come in that situation. Why would you, as a woman or as a black person, sort of, you know, want to give up opportunities at other institutions, good institutions? You know, you know if you're appointed, you'd make it to get tenure and security. Why would you want to come to Harvard? Uh, and with, with, with the 
less than 10% chance of being, gaining tenure. Mm -hmm. And this is especially true for minorities who have responsibilities and who, you know, the privilege can take that chance. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people like myself, I had to support my family. I started supporting my family. I sent a third of my, you know, scholarship funds when I was a graduate student at LSE back home. <laughs> so I, as a black person, couldn't take that risk. You wanted security and so on. So that, uh, that change was absolutely critical and, um, and led to significant developments um, over um, the years. So the tenor track faculty members are more diverse here than most other um, areas um, among women. And I'm going to be talking about not just I mean, all, for all kinds of um, diversity here. Um, the share of female tenure track faculty is now 40 percent, uh, significantly up. Um, and um, the 27 percent of tenured positions across the university is held by women. And uh, over the last 11 years, the overall size of the senior faculty has increased thir by 13 percent, while the number of tenured women has grown by 46 percent. Pretty good. In the case of minorities, 20% of tenured faculty remain that are minorities, reflecting a 73% increase in the number of minority tenured faculty since 2007-2008. And especially, what, what's especially noteworthy is increasing the number of minority faculty um, over time is about increasingly split between Asian Americans up 68% and underrepresented minorities, or up 82%. That's pretty, pretty impressive. But let's look at the um, ethnic diversity at Harvard. Ranked 166 out of 2017 and Whites are now a minority at Harvard, 43.5%. Asians, 17% what's called non-resident um, alien. Originally, I was in that category, 13%. Hispanic, 10%. Black or African-American, 6.7%. And others, unknown, 9%. Now, the good news, however, is to come in a minute. Uh, because remember, this is constitutes all the classes. Um, the um, Harvard's recent class is the most diverse in its history. Just look at this. Asian Americans are 22.9%, which makes you wonder what this lawsuit is all about, but I'll get to that in a minute later. African Americans are now 15.2% of the most recent class. That deserves that to achieve more than our representation in the nation as a whole. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing when you imagine what, when I came here and I was looking around, I couldn't see a black face, except occasionally I'd bounce into Martin Kilson. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> Lord, let's go have a drink. <laughs> this is amazing, guys. And you have to have lived through it um, the way I did to know. Hispanics are 12.3, but that 15.2% is just incredible. Um, the, most recent class is 49% white. Um, one of the interesting things to note about African American uh, percentage, it could, uh, it could have been much higher because a third of blacks reject Harvard. A, a third of offers to blacks are rejected for other colleges. Partly it has to do with income. Same set of factors will apply to me. I had to make those choices, okay? Um, and you know, Harvard may say to, well, we're gonna pay 90% of your students' um, fees and so on. But that 10% may be the entire salary for the family. <laughs> you see? Um, so, but in an ideal world, it would have been significantly higher. Let's just bear that in mind. So the university has just done an incredible job in that regard and deserves credit. Gender diversity is also quite extraordinary. Um, women are 48.5% uh, of Harvard um, undergraduates. 
When I came here, there are no women strictly in Harvard, because they're in Radcliffe. <laughs> then they had this all non-merger merger for a few years. No one knew what I know it's all about. Uh, we, I lived through that, and finally um, they were joined Harvard, but then they were a small proportion. But that's that's there's even better news. There's even better news. Last year class was majority female. Can you imagine that? This is a university which is all male up until, you know, 50 years ago. And then, because I was, by the way, in, I was senior tutor, and I have a whole long story to tell you about that, of Leverett House when Harvard integrated, became, the houses became co-ed. Leverett House, I, I was made senior tutor of Leverett. And the year when women were to join us, the boys, because they're all originally over in Radcliffe. The previous master was so upset with the old thing that he resigned. He gave up tenure and decided to become a bassist in the New York Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> so I, <laughs> myself and Cena Tudor and a new master ended up, uh, little experience, um, to sort of integrate um, Leverett House. It was pandemonium. Um, but in light of that, to see that the majority of women in the most recent class are majority of um, students are women is just astonishing, guys. Huh? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, geographic diversity is something one ought to think about too. Harvard is very, very um, is be, is, has the best um, score. Um, in, uh, of all um, universities, um, and a large community of international students. There's also a greater age diversity among Harvard students, which is worth, again, something worth noting. That is, most students at Harvard and most universities are in the narrow range, age range of you know, 18 to 22. Harvard has a, one of the largest age diversity range of any of the um, um, major universities in, 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 in the country, as this graph shows. Um, only 21.8% of students are in the age range 18 to 21, compared to the um, national average of 60%. This is quite extraordinary, as this graph shows. We have students in their 30s and so on. That's very important. Um, this is a country of second chances, and Harvard sort of exhibits that. Now, let's come to, finally, the issue of economics. Because that, on one, in some respects, would seem to be where Harvard seemed to have fallen back. And um, Professor uh, Chetty's findings, uh, recent findings, would seem uh, not very good. He has argued that Harvard has 23 times as many high-income students as low-income students. That sounds bad, right? Although everything as a comparative and historical sociologist has got to be seen in comparative terms. Most Harvard students come from the nation's richest families. Okay? There are a lot of rich kids out there. Um, but, okay. Now what does that mean? You should never sort of take figures just in isolation. How does this compare both with other places and with the, um, and with the, the yes, sure. This one? Yeah, for example, so born between 1980 and 1991, all right? Mm. So if you're born in 1991, how old are you today? Oh, it's only about 91? Yeah. That's um, 20 something, 20. <laughs> what, what are you, what, what? The point I'm making is that uh, definitely struck recent development. Right, absolutely. A recent development where you now have scholarships for parents who, kids from parents who make less than $100,000. Absolutely, and. and therefore you're getting <coughs> class diversity increasing now. Absolutely, and we have the figures to show that. So, Chetty's study, uh, the median family income of a student at Harvard is $168,000. Okay. 
and 6 7% comes from the top 20%. Uh, 6 7% come from the top 20%, and uh, only 1.8% of students at Harvard come from the poor family, but became rich as adults. Well, However, Harvard is not the wealthiest university. It's ranked, as you may think, it's ranked seventh in median parental income behind Princeton, Duke, Yale, Penn, Dartmouth, and Brown. I have other far richer um, families there. Um, Brown has been the richest uh, median income. Um, Harvard ranks only eight in share of students from the top 1%. Um, it's, and compare with Dartmouth, and it also ranks four in share of, fourth in share of students from the bottom fifth. In terms of aid, the university does very, very well, as, as, as this figure shows. Um, now, again, in term, critical terms, Chetty has argued that about as many students at Harvard come from the top 1% of the income distribution as at the bottom 60%. 16% of Harvard students are eligible for Pell Grants, compared with 32% of all undergraduates. Uh, Anthony Jack, one of our recent graduates from sociology has done a study here, and um, he claims that there's a double advantage of the pri privileged poor, disadvantage of the privileged poor uh, at Harvard. Um, interesting thesis I don't entirely agree with. Um, and there are people like Kallenberg who advocates replacing racial consideration with, eth with income ones. That, uh, this would lower the percentage of blacks at Harvard, by the way, just make that clear. Okay, um, the, um, the, 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 the important thing is that, uh, as Bill just pointed out, Harvard um, position on aid is among the best there is. And thanks to um, uh, Drew Faust on that. And it, within, just within recent years, um, um, we offer, or Harvard offers virtual full scholarships to people below a certain um, income. And even middle class families of up to uh, $180,000 are still getting substantial aid. So uh, it depends on how you look at the figures and how more, more recently uh, you look at it. The university is doing a great job. Uh, Drew uh, faced a real challenge here when we faced some economic crisis a few years ago as a result of problems created by the previous president. And um, um, one of the things she was determined not to do is to cut back on the aid given to, um, to students, um, which she succeeded in doing. So that's where we are at. And um, it can be better in economic terms, but there's tremendous progress being made as it continues. And um, finally, of course, as you know, I can't end without saying something about this. Um, we have a lawsuit right now in the courts. Um, just last Sunday, the New York Times had a front page uh, magazine story on that. Many of you may have read it. We're likely to get a decision soon. The, as that article pointed out, the claim that this is not an attack on affirmative action is not true. They claim this is just something um, having to do with Asian American. A claim brought not by Asian Americans, but who are being used by um, a, a, a white American who is dead set against diversity. That decision could have a devastating effect on everything I just said. Okay, we are at a knife edge here. Mm -hmm. It could ruin everything. And then, people they know that the argument that this has noth nothing to do with affirmative action is just not true. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it goes against Harvard, so great progress, but we face a possible calamity. That's where we are at. Thank you. <laughs>
It's, you essentially have a pool scholarship. Yeah. Okay, so that increases a, 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 a different kind of, of diversity, that yes. is class diversity. That's going to increase over the years, so we'll have to Absolutely. add that as well. That's why I asked what, the, what years the Chetty uh, data reflect. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. No, absolutely. I mean, I, it's for me, it's, it's personal. My grandson is among the freshman classes here. You got him in before affirmative action ends. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, when my daughter saw the Harvard uh, school fees, she said, you know, Dad, I don't know if I can afford this. Yeah. And so I had to get into the nitty gritty. Uh, of, um, of what this means, and she's a middle class uh, person. You know, it's expensive coming here. But what was interesting was how responsive Harvard was to her, you know, entreaties about this. Um, it's an expensive place to, to live, and um, uh, the university has done a, a tremendous job um, for incomes much higher. It's recognized um, that to sort of a middle class family earning what may seem to be a very high $150,000, but if they have three, four kids, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a problem, even if Harvard is offering a uh, 50% um, scholarship. Okay. Uh, Professor West. No, no, please. Oh, thank you so much. What a way to start the year off. Good God <laughs> almighty. I'm Here telling you, brother, brother Orlando. <laughs> Oh, to have, I mean, really, it, it, it's a historic moment to have two towering figures in American sociology, two black brothers who sit at the top of the discipline. That in and of itself is an expression of what you're talking about in terms of overcoming some of these ugly white supremacist barriers, and that's just worth noting to have you all together like that, and Skip has already made, made that point. And um, talking about kids, you know, my daughter turned Harvard down last year. <laughs> She's one of them two, two, one out of three. <laughs> right, <laughs> That's her own go. judgment. God bless and be with her. Keep her near the cross. But uh, uh, she went on to Princeton. She, she made a good choice. But, 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 but my choice is this. My, choice, my, my, my question is this, though, Brother Lando, that, as you know, we, we celebrate the triumph of the black bourgeoisie. Unbelievable talent, in some cases genius, unbelievable breakthroughs. You and our dear brother Wilson, have been concerned about the massive tragedy of black poor people at precisely the same moment that we see this, un this unbelievable progress. How does one come to terms with that simultaneous reality, even as we on the one hand acknowledge that this could be wiped out even for the black middle class right. and the black elites right. and the black professional and chattering classes, as our poor brothers and sisters and poor black and brown and yellow and so forth catch even more hell, more in mass incarceration, right. all the things that you all have talked about with such insight. How, 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 how do you come to terms right. with that? And, and, and Orlando, let me, if I can add a corollary. You add anything you want just to, to, to <laughs> <laughs> no, But it's, I had a, this, a similar question, yes. and I want to meld the two so you can give one response. The one slide you didn't have, which I, at least I wanted to see, was the wealth of the black students who come to Harvard. <laughs> because, um, yeah. and you all are all nodding because you then realize by extension that these are upper middle class black kids, which leads to who benefited from affirmative action. Our dear colleague Lonnie Guinier used to say, initially when we, our generation, integrated historically white colleges, I got to Yale in 69, Cornell, you got to Harvard in 70, right? And I remember him. 70, right, <laughs> right. So we are, <laughs> so we are the crossover generation. Now we are professors there, and by extension, you know, our, our, our peers are in Congress. Sheila Jackson Lee was in um, my class. Ben Carson was in my class at Yale, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, no comment on that, please. <laughs> uh, then, so, and many of us were from working class or lower middle class or middle middle class. Then somehow, our children became the beneficiaries of affirmative action. So, Even our grandchildren. Oh, and our grandchildren. <laughs> so it became a way to perpetuate the class status which we had gained because of affirmative action. It went from being 
a class escalator to a class perpetuator yeah. within the race. Absolutely. End of comment. Now would you comment? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're Th wired. Okay, thanks. Thanks for those comments, because when I mentioned the paradox of um, you know, the civil rights revolution, the fact that it involved um, breaking down the barriers to the public sphere, I forgot to mention, and I've written frequently on that, in fact, that there's another paradox there was that it led to a tremendous growth of the black middle class at the same time that the black working class and low classes were not improving. In fact, one can even make a case that their situation has gotten a bit worse. When you factor in not just income, but the violence, the, 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 you know, the, the degradation of living in these sort of you know, uh, housing conditions, the eviction and so on that they experience you know, in many ways. And in income terms, in fact, as a share of total income, their situation is significantly worse as the Chetty figures indicate. And, so, the, and the class gap within the race. That, well, you've noticed several times, if you look at the inequality data, <laughs> the, the group which has the highest inequality is black America. We don't, I hate to mention that. The Gini index. The Gini, Gini index. index. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, huh? Okay, right. G yes. G yeah, that is, that, that, so what do we make of that? The situation is even worse you want a really bad news. Not only um, is it that the black poor, and Professor Wilson has sort of done more work than anyone else in this nation to highlight their problems. Not only the black poor as a group not advance, not only is their situation getting worse, but here's something else. You mentioned that the black middle class perpetuating itself, in one sense that may be true, but that's also stopped. The black upper middle class may be perpetuating itself, but the degree of downward mobility from the black middle class is disturbingly high. Um, and um, the New York Times has a nice sort of graphic on this, that um, if you look, for example, the proportion of people from the particular class who moved up uh, beyond their parents, um, very small proportion of black uh, middle class people do that, and a significant proportion of the black middle class is downwardly mobile. And when they're mobile, they move to the bottom, not just the class beneath them. That, uh, the Pew, uh, Pew uh, Corporation is the first to point this out, and it's really depressing. In other words, they're not, the black middle class is not perpetuating itself. I bet. Affirmative action admissions at places like Harvard. Rich black kids are getting in yeah. under the diversity principle yes. rather than poor black kids. Abs yes, and that is why Harvard's commitment to income um, diversity is so very important. Because, I mean, I suspect that, I mean, Cornell's order, I mean, you know, sort of maybe wisely choose Princeton, um, but a lot of the reason why um, poor black kids a good proportion of the one third of offers that are rejected tend to be from poor black kids. Um, so it's. Um, Can you there. Yeah. So I just want to reinforce what all you guys have been saying. Um, so if you look at the Gini index, which is a measure of income inequality with zero perfect equality and one maximum inequality. Uh, blacks have the highest, believe it or not, the highest Gini index. But you know what's, what's that re reflected in? Significant growth of blacks with incomes over $100,000 a year. On the other hand, what you were saying, those at the middle, lower middle class blacks yeah. are sliding down. Yeah, right. right. And so Harvard has a disproportionate percentage of families, black families, five-figure, six-figure families here. Right. So the rich are perpetuating themselves, yep, the right? Rich, right? But the middle and the low classes, the middle is losing ground, right. and the low classes is not moving up. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Could you identify yourself? I'm, I'm Bakari Kitwana, and I'm the Nassia, one of the Nassia Jones uh, fellows. Welcome, good brother. Thank you. I wanted to, um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask, thank you, brother. <laughs> 
I noticed that you didn't mention uh, Guineer's uh, father, not, not Lonnie Guineer, but. You what? Uwart, right, I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce his name. I work um, with him. You were Guineer was the first chair of um, our department of at what was then Afro American Afro -American Right, Studies. and he came in 1969. He was also a labor a uh, a activist la and a lawyer, and, and a an lawyer. organizer. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious when I look at your scale of um, one, if you could talk about him more, and why didn't why did you leave him out? <laughs> and then two, when I look at your scale, he falls on your scale with a with a certain within you know maybe on that on that far left end ironically um but i wonder if his if his political analysis would have created a different response so so such that it wouldn't be so easily flipped in the way in which just 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 curious to hear your thoughts i have no idea <laughs> i know a lot about professor Guinea. i'm sure you do <laughs> Uh, when I first came here, I came as a visiting. I was very excited about Afro-American studies. I really came as a visiting yeah. professor in the African-American studies department and um, <coughs> sociology. But, um, and Guineer has just been, just six months after Guineer. So this is, um, I came here about eight months after the big bust, the big um, uproar in which university all, uh, the uni university always taken over and so on. It's a period of great turbulence. And Archie Epps has written on this, by the way. Archie has a fine <coughs> article on this, which you may want to. Didn't want to get into that because we didn't get along. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because um, he was fully committed to a more separatist model mm -hmm. uh, in which the students who were very committed to a separatist model and no whites would be appointed, no, no, no non-black person, but also um, students should students have a vote. should also have a vote tenure. in tenure appointment. Right. Yeah. And that was where we said, <laughs> no, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go along with that, we can't go along. And he was very much a uh, you know, uh, this, this hero of the students. And that's how we started. And what did the details get very murky and unpleasant after that, so I'd rather um, but, maybe we can talk about it in private. But, but, the, <laughs> but the, the irony, the irony is that uh, his daughter went to Harvard and became the first black woman with tenure at the Harvard Law School, Lonnie Guineer. And Lonnie and Nolan's son um, j just became a professor at the Harvard Law School. So the Guineer is very much yes. part of the fabric of Harvard culture since 1969. But most hi historians of the university wouldn't look back at his brief tenure as the first chair as particularly successful. Um, and I think that's an objective way yeah, to put and, it. Yeah, you know, it, it geez. Um, look, um, Harvard was under, it, it, this didn't start well. Let's put it that's this way. I mean, Harvard's under tremendous pressure after the, you know, the riots in 69. I mean, and, um, and made a decision which was unwise. It was unfair to Guinier, it was unfair to the university. He wasn't he, an he academic. He was not an academic. He was a labor lawyer. He didn't have tenure when he came. You, you don't have a place at the table at, at any university unless you have tenure. Yeah, the faculty I, run the university. So he, he couldn't even, you know, the whole thing was set up to collapse. Yeah, to collapse. There's an appointment made in panic. And <laughs> what's that? He rescued us. <laughs> With a lot of help. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we're out of, we're out of time. But um, I can't think of, uh, as Cornell said, I'm just echoing my good brother, I can't think of a more dazzling way to begin what um, will be um, a weekly intellectual feast, the weekly Du Bois Colloquium. Thank you so much. Give it up for Orlando Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> See you all next week. Will the fellows please?